My name is Sandeep Nathan. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the University of Chicago, and it's my distinct pleasure and privilege to moderate this session of uh, conversations in interventional cardiology for the Journal of the Society of Cardiovascular Angiography and Intervention. Today, we'll be discussing the forthcoming uh, expert consensus statement on the management of uh, instant restenosis and stent thrombosis. I'm delighted to be joined uh, by some colleagues. Dr. Lloyd Klein is a clinical professor of medicine at UCSF. Dr. Ron Waxman is the editor-in-chief of Cardiovascular Revascularization Medicine, the founder of the CRT meeting and the associate director of the Division of Cardiology at MedStar. And Dr. Ziad Ali is the director of the DiMatteis uh, Cardiovascular Institute at St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center. Welcome, everyone. I think we'll uh, start off uh, with, uh, with you, Dr. Klein. Perhaps you can uh, share a summary of the, uh, of the paper uh, in consideration and, uh, and, uh, and walk us through some of the, uh, the salient points. Thanks, Sandeep. I want to thank Sky for this opportunity at the introduction for the new consensus statement on the management of insect stenosis and stent thrombosis. I also want to thank my world-class colleagues who contributed the benefits of their experience and specialized knowledge. This new SKY statement provides a comprehensive review of clinical knowledge about stent failure. I am just going to hit a few highlights with emphasis on what's new that deserves every interventional cardiologist's attention. The uh, statement includes a pragmatic outline of how to best assess the mechanism of stent failure, a mechanistic approach to the management of uh, patients with instant resinosis or stent thrombosis, a new sky classification that is time sensitive with mechanistic implications, a review of recent advances in imaging, uh, a new sky recommendation to strongly consider imaging guided PCI at the time of initial stent implantation, a new sky recommendation to strongly consider the use of intracorary imaging to optimize the treatment of these problems, and a new sky recommendation of how to approach recurrent instant restenosis and when to consider cabbage. The new sky classification correlates the most common causes of instant restenosis with its timing, setting the stage for a more thoughtful management approach. And it's great to have Dr. Waxman here because his me mechanistic classification was a critical antecedent. Sky strongly recommends routine evaluation by intracoronary imaging to determine the cause of restenosis. OCT has an advantage related to luminal pathology and evaluating stent expansion, while IBIS is better for plaque characterization. These disparities are predominantly related to depth of field and resolution differences. The most common treatment approach for the first episode of instant restenosis is to implant the second drug eluting stent. However, this is not always the best solution. There's a high likelihood of recurrent restenosis if the underlying etiology is not corrected. If a second stent is needed, its expansion should be image guided. A number of adjunct treatments exist that may be more effective than routine placement of a second stent in some cases. If there is significant underexpansion, it is critical to apply high pressure inflations with non compliant balloons. If there is hyperplasia or heavy calcification, preparation with scoring or cutting balloons, rotoblader, orbital atherectomy, drug coated balloons, vascular brachytherapy, extra laser, or intravascular lymphotripsy may be useful. The statement goes into significant depth as to when each technique might have added a value. Failure to address the original mechanism of restenosis underlies refractory cases. Once a stent sandwich has been created and then fails, repeat restenosis is much more likely, and a third layer of metal almost always is almost always associated with underexpansion. Then the question of resorting to cabbage arises. Variables that might have value in making this decision include multivessel disease, especially proximal involvement, prior cabbage, suitability of the distal vessel for grafting, global and regional function, including viability, comorbid conditions, anticipated completeness of revascularization in response to optimal medical therapy. Transitioning now to stent thrombosis, 
premature termination of the DAP regimen remains the most common cause. Additionally, faults in stent implantation technique may be causative. Sky recommends strongly considering imaging guidance at the initial stent implantation, assuring that these mechanistic components have been addressed. Small cross-sectional area, under-expansion, malapposition, incorrect stent sizing, late positive remodeling, inflow or outflow lesions, plaque prolapse or protrusion, edge dissections, significant residual stenosis, stent overlap, plaque characteristics of a certain kind, hypersensitivity, strut fractures, and neoatherosclerosis. <clears throat> Sky strongly suggests adjunctive imaging to determine its etiology. Most cases can be initially treated with balloon angioplasty alone, sometimes with adjunctive thrombus aspiration when the clot burden is large. High pressure inflation with non-compliant balloons guided by imaging will assure stent acquisition and expansion. Additional stent implantation should be limited to significant residual dissections as metal abets for the thrombosis. This very brief introduction really scratches the surface of what is included in this uh, position statement. Hopefully everybody will get an opportunity to read it and I look forward to our panel discussion. Okay, well that's uh, that's a terrific uh, summary to start us off. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of really good stuff in this, uh, in this document, both for stent thrombosis as well as instant restenosis. And I think one of the strengths of this document is that it's very heavily uh, image-guided, image-driven. So there's some really great case examples in here. I think uh, it is, uh, it's still a very common problem. Uh, I'll open this up to all of the panelists here, but how often would you say that instant restenosis is the sort of uh, a primary uh, reason that you're intervening on a on a patient. How often do you think it's happening, even with the current generation of of drug eluding stents and and uh, adjunctive techniques? Uh, Ron, yeah, in our practice, uh, at least fifteen percent of the interventions are instant restenosis. So, obviously, we know and we learn about low TLF rates at new drug eluding stent. But when we deal with the instant restenosis, it's not necessarily <clears throat> the first year after implantation. It could be two, three, or four years. This problem is continuing to linger. So at the end of the day, when 15% of your interventions are instant restenosis, that's quite substantial. You know, Sandy, <clears throat> the NZDR data shows 14% <clears throat> of all patients who uh, show up to the cath lab have a stent-related problem. So that in conjunction with the five-year data from multiple studies, Dutch Peers 20, and our own uh, CRF cohort shows that by five years, about one in four patients returns back to the hospital with something related to their stent. So, you know, we're really not as good as we think we are or as good as we could be. Yeah, I think uh, I think that that squares with uh, what we see here, and I'm not sure that there's a unifying trait, uh, as uh, Ron alluded to. Some of this uh, potentially is neoatherosclerosis, and it's sort of unfairly characterized as as neointerval proliferation. A, a whole lot of it is just undersized stents, underexpanded stents, and I think you know one of the critical callouts from this uh, from this consensus statement is the uh, the strong uh, nudge uh, to use intravascular imaging uh, uh, both with first-time implantation as well as with uh, with treating instant restenosis. Uh, Ziad, uh, you're one of the founders of OPCI. Uh, can you talk a little bit through the uh, the uh, your approach and sort of philosophy for uh, for imaging guidance? Well, um, as you know, we're advocates of intravascular imaging both pre and post because uh, the pre optimizes uh, your lesion preparation and land your stent from normal to normal. We know that inadequate lesion preparation is an independent predictor for stent failure as well as landing into plaque. And in the post-procedure, there are things that relate both to instant restenosis but also stent thrombosis. So you'll notice there's overlap there. Intramural hematoma from a dissection, underexpanded stents, and then malapposition and their potential relationship to, to stent thrombosis. So, you know, what we've 
we know clearly from multiple studies, including randomized controlled trials, is that if you use intravascular imaging, you can definitely impact your lesion preparation. You elongate your stent between four to six millimeters when you land in normal, and you eliminate those post-procedure complications that can lead to failure, such as edge dissection, intramural hematoma, malopposition, and underexpansion. Yeah, I may like to add that uh, this is not an adjective, it is a must to do imaging when you want to reduce risk stenosis and also to diagnose what type of uh, the mechanism that is entailed for the risk stenosis. But I, I would like actually to add to that part that uh, the imaging also help you to understand how to treat those patients. It's not just diagnosis and what type of uh, instant risk stenosis that you have. So clearly, um, imaging is a key. We actually did publish a paper from the Eye Open Registry just for instant stenosis that were treated with and without imaging. And obviously, like I've shown always, if you have used imaging for the treatment of instant stenosis, you had better outcome and less events over a long period of time. But if you really want to reduce stenosis in the first place, you have to use imaging also post-procedure in terms of selection vessel preparation. It goes with optimizing the PCI. One of the obstacles has been that the uh, society guidelines have not made imaging, intracoronary imaging, a class one recommendation uh, either before, during, or after the procedure. And hopefully what this position statement will do is to try to uh, convince interventional cardiologists that it's really worth their while and their time on their patient's behalf to do that. Um, one of the issues has been, uh, and I'm talking to two people who've done these studies, uh, is that uh, of the concept that uh, the studies that we have aren't so definitive as to make them class one indications. And I think that's terribly Unfortunate is very difficult to make a patient their own control to get that kind of uh, definitive information. And I think that hopefully that'll be one outcome of this statement. Lloyd, you're absolutely right. I think the, that's the only way I can characterize it in a nice way from the guideline committee. I'm sure they will correct it. Uh, I congratulate you for putting this consensus experts. And there was another one that came from the Council of Interventional Cardiology at the, the ACC, basically stating the same thing, that this should be on the upfront of treating. Uh, and not only instant stenosis, I think it should be integral from most of the procedure that we are doing. So um, this will be corrected. I'm sure in the next version of the guidelines, I can predict now, and it's on the record, this will be corrected. So let me uh, let me pivot now and talk uh, in the last few minutes we have uh, maybe pick everyone's brains on uh, on therapy for uh, for instant restenosis. So we have a number of new tools. Of course, uh, IBL has kind of taken the world by storm over the last few years. Uh, we have uh, ultra high pressure balloons vis-a-vis -vis, uh, OPNNC, and hopefully in the near future we'll have uh, DCBs for uh, you know in coronary sizes. Um, um, a lot of us are of course using things in off-label capacities and so on as, as sort of a last resort, but maybe everyone can uh, talk through how their approach to underexpanded stents as a driver for re stenosis, how that's sort of evolved in the last couple of years. Uh, Underexpansion stent is very common. I think Zia alluded to that already. Uh, most of the patients that come to us for brachytherapy there is some degree of underexpansion. Some of them, this is the only mechanism. So we even we don't do a, a brachytherapy because the treatment is different. So you don't appreciate how much underexpansion. Now it could be that some of those are recoil. Uh, I cannot attribute everything or blame everything on the operator. Uh, some could be a recoil of the stent, but underexpansion is a big component of the ISR. You know, Ron's point is important, and that's where, again, the imaging helps. If you do an imaging-guided PCI to begin with, and then you see that the stent looks subsequently underexpanded, then clearly it's recoil. So you have uh, a, a clear-cut explanation for why you, your findings are. In fact, we found on serial OCTs 
that as you develop neoantimal hyperplasia on the thinner stent struts, it actually pulls the stent along with the neoantima as it grows towards the lumen, which makes, of course, perfect sense. Then it looks like the stents are underexpanded, but it's actually a process of the neoantimal hyperplasia. I think is important in the sky document is that we're actually going to significant detail about where the different modalities can be helpful. So obviously you should not use intravascular lithotripsy for a fibrotic multiple layer neoantimal hyperplasia mechanism, but for an underexpanded stent due to calcium, it could be, although off-label, a very good treatment as could laser. On the contrary, if you have only neoantimal hyperplasia soon after, you know, when drug-coated balloons are available, that might be a very good approach to kick the can down the road. So the, the level of detail I think is appropriate in the Sky document that can be digestible by the practicing physician, but also it does actually provide a fair amount of detail about where which technology may be applicable at its most uh, optimal. Okay, well, that, that's, uh, I think, a terrific uh, uh, summary of some of the highlights. Uh, we're almost at time, so uh, Dr. Klein, I'll give you the, the final word. Any final thoughts about this, uh, this uh, important document? The idea of the document is to be a living document and one that other interventional cardiologists and those in practice are going to follow. This isn't intended to be an ivory tower academic exercise, and I really hope that... Uh, with sky support that interventional cardiologists around the country and around the world will read it and try to incorporate this into their practice. Agreed. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much, everyone, for uh, for uh, joining us today, uh, Dr. Waxman, Dr. Ali, Dr. Klein, uh, on behalf of uh, Jay Sky and the uh, the co-authors of this document. Thanks so much for tuning in. <laughs>